As we have been studying in the book of Colossians, we have been reading about Paul's encouragement and his admonitions to this church. This church that was grounded in the truth of the gospel as they had been taught it by one of their elders, Epaphras. And yet there are external influences at work in this church. And so Epaphras has grown very concerned and he has called upon the apostle to write them a letter, to exhort them in the truth of the gospel and in the doctrine of Jesus Christ and of our faith in him and what that faith means, what it entails, what are the consequences of the sacrifice of Christ? What are the results of his atonement? And so Paul has been writing to this church. There are problems creeping in. There are conflicts arising in their midst. Jesus said that in the church, you would have the wheat. You would have the true believers in Jesus Christ, who indeed have saving faith, who are born again believers by the, by the Spirit of God, regenerated by the power of God. Yet Jesus also warned us, before the church was ever born, Jesus said, yes, there will be the wheat of God, the people of God, but there will be the weeds, there will be the tares, there will be the false believers, the false teachers, the wolves in sheep's clothing. There will be laymen in the pew who begin to bring in subtle heresies. There will be people in the midst of the people of God who claim to be part of the flock of God and yet bring in heresies against the gospel of God that the gospel we have received is not enough. You need something more. If you truly want access to God, then you need to follow this way, these rules. You, you need to add to your faith rituals, some sort of practice, some sort of deed, some sort of philosophy, some sort of tradition, some extra dogma, Jesus said, there will be the wheat in his church, but that there will also be the weeds in his church. And he explained to us that he will not deal with them during the age of the church. Let them grow together. Let them grow together. Do not take out the weeds quite yet. Because in doing so, you may damage the wheat. And that's what I'm concerned about. The wheat, my true people, those who have been born again by the seed of the word of God. Let them grow alongside of the false believers. Let the sheep be held with the goats. When I come back, when I return, Jesus said, I will set things right. I will send in my angels. And they will harvest my wheat. And they will separate the wheat and the weeds, the wheat and the tares. And they will take the weeds, the tares, those false believers who have corrupted the church, that mixed multitude, and they shall be cast out into eternal darkness. And they shall be burned with fire. They shall be judged for their false profession. For their mixture of lies into the truth. I will bring the sheep and the goats together and I will separate them. On my right hand of favor I shall call my people, my sheep, and I shall usher them into the joy of their Lord. But the goats I will separate onto my left and they shall be banished ever from my sight. There will be a great judgment in the end, but that judgment has not come, nor will it, until Jesus Christ returns. In the meantime, ever since 
the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2, ever since the foundation that the apostles laid, which was the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, ever since the church was established, wherever it has been founded, wherever churches have been planted, it has never taken very long for the goats to be mingled with the sheep for the weeds and the tares to begin growing amongst the wheat. And Epaphras has become concerned about this. He sees the problems creeping in. Perhaps he has in his mind people in the pew who are beginning to bring in subtle heresies. Perhaps from their background. They could be from a Jewish background. Well, you got to keep the Sabbath. Don't forget all of those feasts. Don't forget the law of Moses. Don't forget all of these regulations. Don't forget the dietary laws of food and drink. Don't forget the festivals and the new moons and the Sabbath and all of these ceremonial activities. Don't forget about it. Just because you've accepted Christ, don't forget about these things that are firmly taught in the Old Testament. Don't forget about our Jewish heritage, our Jewish roots. Don't forget how God has ordained that we approach Him. Don't forget about these things. They could also be from pagan backgrounds, which would have had certain initiation rites into those pagan mystery religions. Paul seems to imply such history in these verses. He seems to have in mind those from a Jewish background and those from a pagan background and perhaps a mixture of the two that is coming in and polluting the Colossian church. And so Paul writes to set these things straight. And the people that will hear him are God's true people. We're always going to have the false. And they're never going to receive the instruction of Scripture. But those who have been born again will heed the word of God. For those who have been born again by the Spirit, they seek nourishment from the milk of the word and from the meat of God's truth. And that is where they desire to grow in their faith of Christ. That is where they desire to learn of their religion in Jesus Christ. So as we read through these verses... Paul is attempting to make a stark contrast, as he has been doing throughout the letter, but here especially, a stark contrast between the religions of men and the religion of Christ. What the religions of men entail, what the religions of men command, what the religions of men require, versus what the religion of Christ has accomplished. And we will see these things, and let's begin to read. We concluded last week in verses 16 and 17, and Paul continues on. And he says, Let no one defraud you of your reward. Let no one cheat you. Let no one deceive you. Do not be taken in by anything that is contrary to the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, speaking of people who take delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, or most modern translations, the things which he has seen or which he has claimed to have seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head. And we have learned specifically in the Colossian letter, the head of the church is Jesus Christ. But these who attempt to deceive you and put all of these regulations upon you, they do not hold fast to the head, to Jesus Christ. 
from whom all the body nourished and knit together, the body of Christ, that is the church, is nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments. We all have a part to play. We are, we are all members of the body of Christ. Grows with the increase which is from God. Now let's stop and think about these couple of verses for a moment. The point that Paul is making is that the true spiritual increase of the church, the true spiritual nourishment of the church, the true spiritual power of the church is from God. It is from God through Jesus Christ as he has outlined all the way through. But you see, there are people who deceive. There are people who add to the gospel. They, they did it in the early church as we see. But this type of empty and polluted philosophy has not left us. You can still find professing Christians. You can still find established churches that call people to something beyond Jesus Christ. As a freshman in college, I was waiting for my next class. So I was just sitting outside in the quad area of Cal State Fullerton. And I was approached by two young men who began to share the gospel with me. And I was quite impressed. Here I am at this public university. And these two men have taken the time, these two students, to witness to me. Oh, brothers, I'm saved. I grew up in my grandpa's church, which he founded, and I accepted the Lord at an early age, and I was baptized, and all of this. And I congratulated them for their courage, told them how blessed I was to be approached by them. And they were not phased by my testimony. Now, they didn't know me. They didn't know if I was a good Christian or not. All they could know is what I told them that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, that I was baptized. That's all I had told them. But they were yet serious with me. Well, they began to question my baptism. What kind of church were you baptized in? And how exactly were you baptized? What do you believe about baptism? And I began to explain to them my Baptist understanding of baptism, that it is a portrayal of my profession of faith in Christ, that I've been buried with him and raised again to, to walk with him in newness of life. And they began to explain, well, no, no, no. Baptism is far more important than just painting a picture for everybody to see. Baptism is the key to salvation. Baptism is what saves you. And if you weren't baptized the right way in the right church, you need to be saved. Oh, I wouldn't have had conversations with your dear pastor here. What in the world was this? They took me to some Bible verses. I was like, what's going on here? I've never heard such a thing. I was brought up, of course, in a church that knew nothing but the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ. We certainly never preached baptismal regeneration or baptismal salvation or anything like it. Such a new thing. But that's what Paul was dealing with here. People who would creep in and begin to take advantage of people's ignorance. Begin to deceive them and take away their reward. Isn't it wonderful to have confidence of your salvation until somebody weasels in and says, Oh, I don't know if you're really saved. You just have faith in Christ. You're not following these rules. You haven't had the proper baptism. You're not belonging to the right church. Oh, then I don't think you should be so confident. See, Paul had told us before that we, verse 10, we are complete in him. We're not lacking anything. In him we have everything. He is the fullness of God. And when we have Jesus, we have the fullness of God with nothing missing, nothing lacking. 
And yet, Paul is combating people who would cheat the believer, who would deceive God's people, and would begin to add, oh, they sound so humble. They take delight or they insist on humility. You've got to have the right approach to God. You've got to be humble, and here is how you do it. Here, Paul speaks about those who would look to the worship of angels. And this can be taken one of two ways, and they're both viable. It could be you worshiping angels, or you following after the example of the angels who worship God, and creating sort of an extra step, sort of coming through the worship of angels to worship God. And intruding into those things which he has seen. The, the pagans in, in the Greek times, they, they would have these initiation rites and their mystery religions, and they would have these rooms. And when you would first encounter them and first embrace their religion, you could go into the outer room. And then as you went a little further, you could go into the inner room. And you could boast about the things that you had seen and learned there. And Paul says, this has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. This is something which vainly puffs up the fleshly mind. This is the religion of men that gives people something to boast about and to brag about. But Paul said, speaking of Christ in verse 3, in him is hidden in him are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's nothing else to discover in life once you have found Jesus Christ. The truth of God is found in him. The truth of God as it is revealed in scripture is all that we need. There is nothing lacking, nothing missing. We are complete in him. And as we follow Christ, we learn true humility. We are corrected of our pride. And we are those who bow the knee to Jesus Christ. And we call ourselves disciples, followers. We call ourselves sheep of his hand. Members of his body. But those who would take away your confidence... Those who would say you need something else. You need to start with Christ, but you need to go past Jesus Christ. And notice Paul says, as he goes on in verse 20, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, from the elements of the world system, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Now notice Paul is getting a little more personal here with the Colossians. And this is how we know there are weeds in the midst of the wheat. Now he's correcting people in the pew. We know that this church has been established properly. We know that they are a loving congregation. We know that this is a solid church, but there is that external influence that is beginning to creep in. Why do you, Colossian church, why do you, Christian, why do you, as though living in the world, subject yourselves to regulations as a way to gain access to God? That even though you have come to Christ, Jesus is the one, remember, who said, no one comes to the Father but by me. And so you have come to Jesus Christ to have access to God. You have come through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So why are you now submitting yourselves to these regulations? to these religious rituals, as if this is something else that you need in order to worship God. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Stay away from this, don't do that. Which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Jesus said the same thing back in Mark chapter seven when he encountered a similar problem among the Jews and Pharisees of that time. Jesus condemned them and he admonished the people who are putting the commandments and the traditions of men 
the rituals and religious activities of men, traditions and such, above the word of God. We saw in the Psalm of David today as we read through Psalm 40, it's not the sacrifices you want. It's not the rituals you are after, it's the heart. And that was always true. That was the point we were making last week. When we spoke about the shadows of Christ that are found in the Old Covenant. It's not that the Sabbath is no longer meaningful. We have simply found its ultimate meaning in Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that the sacrificial system has lost its meaning. No, we have found the meaning of the sacrificial system in the cross of Christ. He is our Passover. What has changed is not the importance, it's not the significance of the Old Covenant that has changed. It is our relationship to it. Those were the copies. Those were the shadows. Those were the things preparing us. And we walk through the great patriarchs of the Old Testament, noting how they apparently were trying to tell us that we will never be able to satisfy and fulfill the law, and we will never be able to approach God through the law. We need something more, something better, which is the entire theme of the book of Hebrews. Christ is the one who is the better high priest. He is the better sacrifice. He has inaugurated the better covenant. He is better than angels. He is better than men. He is better than anything and everything. He has brought to fulfillment all that the Old Testament was looking forward to. The Old Testament theme is always banishment because of disobedience. No matter who you were, Adam and Eve banished because of disobedience. Moses, banished because of disobedience. The people of God in the Promised Land, banished to Babylon because of disobedience. So the Old Testament, which in the Hebrew Bible ends in 2 Chronicles with banishment, is leaving us in suspense. The music has played us into a, a place of suspense. Okay, what are we going to do? What will be the answer? What will be the solution? The law has brought death. The law is the knowledge of sin. And so then the gospel is provided to us. As we go in our Bibles from Malachi, we turn the page into the new covenant of Christ. And we open up with the birth of the Messiah. And we have four gospel narratives telling us, fulfilling that suspense that was hanging in the air. What do we do? Where will we find life? How will the promises be fulfilled? How can we have access to God? And Jesus is the answer. And so here, Paul is telling these people, the answer doesn't lie in your regulations and your rituals. These things have no value. Notice what he says in verse 23. They have the appearance of wisdom. Oh, don't you look so good when you do this or when you don't do that? Don't you seem so righteous? They have the appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but they're of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. They're of no value against our sinful nature. You can find the most ascetic person who doesn't do anything, and you'll find pride in their heart. Paul was a great Pharisee. He says, I followed all those commandments. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. But then I came to a strange one. The last one said, don't covet. And I realized it was speaking to my heart because nobody knew if I was coveting or not. I could pull the wool over everybody's eyes, but apparently God knew the truth and the law killed me. There was nothing I could do. Even as a righteous Pharisee, I found that I was only self-righteous. And churches fall into this. You, you find different ways. They, they either go into legalism or they abandon everything. There's no rules. There's no law. There's no morality. Everything is fine. Anything goes. The truth is found in Christ. It's not found in rituals. It's not found in licentiousness. The truth is found in Christ. And there's a balance to be understood. Paul isn't here saying that there is no place for morality in the body of Christ. Paul is not here saying that we should not have a proper conduct as becomes Christians. 
He's saying that that proper conduct has no bearing on our access to God and of our worship of the Father. We have access through Christ. And as the Holy Spirit has made us alive in Christ, then we want to please the Lord. We want to live lives that reflect His law which converts the soul. His law which is good. His law which is wonderful. So it's not about abandoning morality. And it's not about following rituals and regulations and do's and don'ts. It's about understanding that you are complete in Christ. And that there's a life to be lived in Christ. Paul will speak in chapter 3 about putting off the things of the old man, putting off the sinful nature. But it's not about having access to God. It's about pleasing your Father. And there is a big difference there. There is a massive difference in, oh, I, I make sure I do this and do that so I can get into heaven. Or I make sure I do this and I do that so I don't spend too many years in purgatory. Or I make sure I do this and do that so I can enjoy the Mass. Or go to this confession so I can do this. There are ch churches that heap loads of rituals upon the cross of Christ. But the cross was sufficient. And that's what it comes down to. What do you believe about the cross of Christ? What do you believe about Jesus Christ and his atonement for sin? Was it enough? Was it sufficient? Paul said earlier, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, in verse 14, that with his cross, Jesus wiped out the handwritings of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way. He nailed all of that to the cross. And so we can now rest in him. What is the answer to the sin nature? He, he speaks in verse 23 that these rituals and regulations, they don't answer the sinfulness and the indulgences of the flesh. What is the answer, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5? Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It's, ama it's amazing the ills of the Christian life that obedience cures. I'm afraid the Western church, the American church, the evangelical church, we have gotten so used to sin, so used to a lackadaisical approach to God, so used to an anything goes approach. Well, I'm saved in Christ. Everything's under the blood. I don't have to worry about anything. I can live as I please. I don't have to serve the Lord or, or please the Father. I don't have to worry about grieving the Holy Spirit. And we wonder why we're so weak. We wonder why sin what runs rampant in our pews and runs rampant in our pulpits. We hear week after week and year after year about scandals across the land. Scandal after scandal. Who's going to be the next leader to fall? Who's going to be the next Christian to abandon and apostatize from their faith in Christ? We're so used to it. It's amazing the ills that obedience cures. Walk in the Spirit. Get as close as possible to the Lord Jesus, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That is what has value. We're talking about true wisdom, not the appearance of wisdom. We're talking about the religion of Christ, not self-imposed religion. We're talking about true humility, bowing before the Master, rather than false humility. We're not talking about neglect of the body as if there's something wrong with the body as God made it. We're talking about a new creation, a new life in Christ and enjoying life as God intended it in the first place. The answer to man's religion is Christ's religion. The answer to these problems that go on in the church with the wheat and the tares, with the sheep and the goats, with the truth and the false, 
is Jesus Christ himself. We are complete in him. We must, as he says in verse 9, hold fast to the head. Don't let go of Jesus Christ because that is where the growth comes from. It is the power of God and the growth of God as it is found in Jesus Christ. And we must beware lest we look anywhere else except into the face of our Savior.